Hello everybody, this is Jack Dennis and welcome to our YouTube channel. As I promised in our introduction to our uh, winter season for uh, 2023 that we'd be visiting some fly tires that maybe a lot of people, especially in this day and age, have never really heard of. Uh, many of them are still alive, uh, a lot of them have passed on. But the first one for this season, I'm gonna tell you about a guy that I've known for a long time uh, that's no longer with us, but his creations are. And many of first are gonna say, oh, I'll bet you're talking about Dave Whitlock. Well, as I've said before about Dave Whitlock, he's one of a kind. But this is a, a, a person, his name is Don Ordez. And there's probably no fly tire in the world when he was alive uh, that was more creative than Don. His flies are truly works of art, and some of his wilder creations are quite humorous. Uh, he looks at fly tying with the eye of an artist. He takes a great variety of materials and brings flies to life that most fly fishers would never dream of. A lot of them are just decorations, but he was a fantastic normal fly tire with beautiful streamers and nymphs and created a technique called rope dubbing. And just uh, a number of years before he died, he put out a video uh, about how to do rope dubbing. And I'm going to share that with you. Uh, and you're going to get a chance to know Don uh, a little better. He lived in uh, Wyoming. He was a, uh, an engineer that uh, worked on oil recovery. And fly tying was kind of a side for him. And it kept him, as you always said, pretty sane. And he was one of the nicest people to be around. And he was a very, very much a, uh, uh, a fixture at the International Sportsman's uh, uh, events, at, at the fly fishing show, and at many regional uh, fly tying uh, club events, uh, including the Wasatch Expo, which would turn out to be one of his last expos that he went to, and he would bring his wonderful displays of all his creations. But uh, you're gonna see a different side of Don. You're gonna see a guy tying techniques that I, I know that you're gonna find useful. And I'll tell you, uh, all I can say is I enjoyed my friendship with him. Uh, I've never seen him without a smile on his face. He was a fabulous cook. You know, we invited him to many dinners with us and uh, being originally from Louisiana, he, he just was a character. And I, I hope that you uh, get the true uh, meaning of this really fabulous fly tire that many of you maybe have never heard of. Let's hear what Dave Whitlock had to say about Don Ardez. Don is a very gifted and talented fly tire, but he also has a wonderful outlook on our sport. His unique sense of humor and his fantastic fantasy flies have made Emily and I and thousands of other fly fishermen smile and laugh and enjoy fly tying even more. Dave Whitlock. So I'm going to present in his own words, uh, Don Ordez uh, rope dubbing. Hello, my name is Don Ordez, and today I'll be demonstrating the rope dub technique, which I developed about 30 years ago in tying realistic stoneflies. As we go through the video, I'll be demonstrating the many advantages it has over standard dubbing techniques. You'll see that the technique is very fast, easy to master, and very flexible and variable over a wide range of materials. You'll see that your flies can be very strong tying on monofilament, bite tippet, or wire, and also that the looks will be served very well in segmentation, taper, color variations, and all-in-one pass. Also, you can add a hackle to your dubbing for very durable flies. at the bench and what I've done is laid out all the materials and a set of sample flies to look at. Uh, basically they go from a starting technique using different materials and flow through finished flies that you'd actually use for fishing. Now again the rope dub is a fundamental technique of tying and what tires do is adapt that 
technique to all the many different patterns that they want to tie in the looks and effects that each material gives you. Now that brings us to the types of materials that can be rope dubbed, which is basically anything that can be wrapped around a hook. Anything linear, anything synthetic, any type of fur can be used. And we'll go into the different techniques and how to use a raw fur on a dub, how to use marabou, how to use blended dubbing, how to use synthetics, how to use holographics and quick descent, how to use different feathers like peacock and pheasant, and how to use synthetic uh, hackle hackles like this to actually create flies as you see there. What we're doing now is looking at the fundamental tools that are required for the rope depth technique. From here forward is what I need for the fundamental technique. I have dubbing, I have a hook, I have thread, and then I have a scissors. Uh, that's all you need to start the rope dub technique. As we move along in different types of materials, we'll be using other tools and materials, and we'll be discussing those as we get into each pattern. But for right now, let's leave it with a dubbing, a vise, and a hook, a thread, and a scissors. Okay, what we're going to do now is show the fundamental rope dub technique, and I'm going to pick a dubbing that gives people a lot of problems because with the dubbing tool and waxes you kind of destroy the capabilities of this and it's very hard to get shape. So I'm going to show you how easy this is with the rope dub technique, how in just seconds you can put together a perfect fly body that is segmented and tapered with no tools and wax. So here we go. We're going to pull the dubbing off and what that does is leave trailing fibers. I'm looking for a shape that I can work into the shape of the fly and right now I'm working with a teardrop because I want to taper. The technique requires tying the material down to the back end of the hook. That's our anchor now. Using that anchor and to thread to work on, I'm going to put my bobbin over the left hand, and I'll tell you in a little bit why I'm using the monofilament, and I'm going to take my dubbing with two fingers of my left hand, two fingers of my right hand, and twist away from me, and depending upon the type of material that you're using, you may have to use different or multiple fingers to turn. But as I'm using the thread to basically apply this material to, it's going around the thread without twisting the thread. It has to bind up because it's anchored to the hook. That allows me to move the dubbing up and down the thread. So if as I want to shape the fly, I can pull my materials longer or I can push them in shorter. I am not set to be entrapped inside of a dubbing loop. Now as I finish my spin, I'll go below it like this to show you how tightly I can compress that. I can compress it much tighter than with thread because I'm not spinning my thread. I'm only spinning the dubbing. If I went too tight, I would actually break the dubbing loose from the hook right there. That would be the weakest link in the whole thing. So now I go very tight without letting go of the dubbing. I swap hands and I wrap forward on the hook. You'll notice that I'm getting segmentation. I'm getting taper. And as I go to the front, I finish off. And I have a finished fly with no tools and no wax. Now for the next extension of the rope dub technique, we're going to do the same thing, except we're going to change colors. I'm going to pick three colors out of my color palette here. Basically all the different color dubbings that I want to use. And as you'll see, I have a light color to a darker green to a black. And as I clinch that down on the light end, that'll put my light color first, my dark color at the mid portion of the fly, and the very front of the fly will be the black color. So as I start to spin, you'll see the colors as they tighten create a tapered fly that has three color patterns on it. Now when I grab the black end, I tie this down, I come forward, and I finish the fly with a black head. Therefore I have a three colored fly in one tie. Again, no loop, no wax. do is 
is introduce one of the tools. This is a dental toothpick. It's got a little file system on the end of it. And you can get these from a dentist. You can also get them in a fly shop. What I'm going to do is pick this fly to add the fuzzy character to it, if that's what you require for your fly. And so with a tight rope dub, now I not only have segmentation, but I also have added fluffiness to my fly. Okay, now we're also going to work our dubbing a different way. I just showed you how to work the dubbing while it's on the hook, but now I'm going to show you how to work the dubbing while it's still on the thread. I'm going to use a thread like a palette, like an artist uses a palette, and I, my dubbing is going to become my paints. So as I spin my dubbing out and it tightens, I have the capability now to vary what I want to see. As you notice, again, I am not tied to the thread. I can move my dubbing up and down. I can skinny it out. I can make this portion wider. One of the nice things about the rope dubbing technique is if I need more dubbing, I can always add more dubbing to the pattern and make it thicker. I can pull dubbing out of it. And I can also pick it while it's right here on the thread so that I get a fluffy look while I still keep my segmentation in the center, now it's fluffy while it's on there. I can use a toothbrush, I can use a dubbing pick, like so, and I can use a toothbrush to really fluff it out. Then after I tighten, get it very tight, I'll still have my underneath segmentation, but I'll have the fluffiness of the fly which is the effect I was trying to achieve. It'll go through the three color variations and there we have it. Okay, what we're going to do now is the next step in using our dubbings and our thread to work on is we're going to pick some different colors of the dubbing again like we did before but we're also going to mix our dubbings by going to a holographic quick descent and a gold quick descent to add some highlights and flash to this fly so depending upon where I want to see the highlight and flash I take that material start rolling it up pull it apart lay it on top of each other and there's my different colorations. Now, depending upon how much you blend, you'll go from a graduated color to a mottled color. But the important thing now is to find just a small portion of it, tie it down. And that'll give us a slim end. If I perhaps wanted a very thick start to the fly, I would roll that over and tie a bigger portion of it down. And you'll see how this creates a fly that starts much thicker than the diameter of the hook. So again, I'm going to take my material. I've got the gold, three colors of green, and some holographic, and I'm going to start spinning. If I were only spin the top, you'll see how the whole thing starts roping out because it's attached to the hook. But I'm going to speed up the process by doing two fingers and then move my hair, my material down to the front of it, now I've got a nice thick rope. If I want it fluffy, I can flick it out and then get it real tight, wrap it around the hook. And now I have multicolored dubbings blended in, graduated, and the finished fly. What I'll do now is show how the technique is very adept at handling a very tough to dub material which is a synthetic short fibered material like this. You might think well this is very hard to put in you'd have to build a brush or something like that and I'm going to show you just how easy this material adapts to this method. Again we do the same exact thing we grab the material using all of our fingers to keep it gathered and as we spin you'll notice it starts to tighten and starts to rope. 
Now we can do different things along the rope to adjust how fluffy we want it, how many hackles are standing out. And when we get it finally tightened, we can pick it, get our hackle standing out depending upon how much we want. And as we rope it forward, we will get a segmented underbody and a sparkle hackling. And within seconds again, we have a synthetic roped fly, dubbed fly. And if you were to tie that on a wire base, that would be pert near bulletproof for fish teeth. What I'm doing now is we're going to advance the technique application another couple of points and I'm going to start my anchor. Notice when I do my anchor I do a few wraps to the front and then back over those wraps and tie it down. Add durability to a fly and what I'll do now is basically explain what I'm using for thread. I'm using six pound test uh, trilene line that I bought in bulk spools and put it onto a, a large bobbin and using a heavy weight fly tying bobbin. I can use any types of thread. I can use a flat wax to fine thread for fly tying um, or a nylon thread. Uh, any, anything will work because we're not actually spinning the thread, we're actually spinning just the dubbing. What I'm going to show now is that now I don't always have to dub my rope on the material that I'm tying the fly with or on the, with the thread I'm tying the fly with. Now I've tied down a, a wire on a spool. I'm also going to tie down a hackle. This is a long saddle hackle. And I'm going to tie down some dubbing. The difference between this and the other techniques that I've shown so far is I'm going to take off the thread and tie on my tag material. Now this can be wire, this could be bite tippet, this could be a heavy monofilament, it can be anything that you need for that fly and I'll be showing in later ties how to make this core material work for you when it's not your actual tie material. If I were to do just a wrap like so and go forward and do the tail end of my fly I would be done and I would normally palmer the hackle but if a tooth of a fish were to bite this hackle, palmer through, the hackle would unwrap and the fly would be basically history as far as a palmered version. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to back off where I started and I'm going to introduce my hackle, break it off at the length that I'm working with, and I'm going to spin it right in there with the dubbing. And as you notice, as the dubbing tightens, the hackle becomes part of the dubbing rope so that when I go forward now and wrap the fly I have a dubbed fly that has the hackle included. And I'll trim off the tag in and we're done. A bulletproof hackle fly in less than a minute. Okay, what I'm going to do now is change the hook style, change the shape of the fly. We're going to do a scud pattern with the roping technique, creating segmentation. So I want a fly that's fat in the center, but tapered on the back end, tapered on the front end, and has the bulk of the fly in the center. Depending upon the size of the fly and the density of it, you'd vary the amount of material you're using. But for these demonstration purposes, so I want it to really stand out. I'm using quite a bit of dubbing, but you'll see as I spin this out how dense it'll go and give me the body and segmentation that I'm looking for. See how that works? Now it's fat in the center. If I fly going forward now, I get segmentation and I finish up at the front end and I have a shrimp pattern that's segmented. I take my dubbing pick pick out the bottom and I have a scud pattern. Now if you want to put a clear scud back over the top you would leave that hanging. 
leave part of your mono thread hanging off the back or a bobbin of wire. Lay your scud back over the whole fly, follow up with a wrap in the segments and you'll get a flashback to style scud. But applying the dubbing again is simple and quick, giving segmentation with this method. Now if you like to start a fly, you can actually use your tying wire as extra weight along with the durability of it. And to show how this would work, let's use some th synthetic dubbing. I'll just pull it right out of the container here. I like these containers because when you pull the dubbing, it automatically tapers out. And I'm going to take this small end and fasten it down. Once I fasten it down, I swap my hands, hang it, put tension on the wire, spin the material around the wire and get it tightened up. I'll go underneath so you can see it tighten. Now is when I can play with the material. I can pick it, I can fuzz it out, I can move it up and down, make the fly thicker, thinner, change the taper, and within just a few seconds I have a finished fly. And we just have to finish the front end the way you would like to. You can put a bead on it, barbell eyes, rubber legs, however you want to finish this fly. The back end is done. Okay, what we're going to start with is something everybody's pretty familiar with. It's a hare's ear fly. And we're going to be using rabbit dubbing, just like we normally do. But I've done a little bit of a different adaptation to the rope dub. I've tied my wire down, but I've left the tag in a little bit long. So now I'll tie an olive colored hair's ear. I'll pick out my dubbing. Notice I don't have to do too much with it. Basically have to find a few hairs to tie down. Depending upon how dense I want the fly to start with, I leave the material dense towards the hook. And I can wrap it around my tying thread like so, go forward, and then finish up with the metal wrap. Or I can bring this like we've done in the past, take my tying thread off, and snip that. Then take my wire core, bring my material up. Remember, I can do anything I want on this now, I'm taking my dubbing apart, and I'm putting it where I want. As you'll see, as the fly starts to tighten, it'll get the shape that I'm looking for. And I can get any shape body, any taper, by placing the material along the hook, along the wire, as I am wrapping it. So therefore, we get our taper, like so. If I want it extra fluffy, I can flick it, or I can hit it with a dubbing brush, or I can come back with a pick and really pick it out and make it extra fluffy. So we're going to bring it really tight and wrap it forwards, and we get our fluffy hair's ear body. And I've even got the front end ready for the wing case. Notice how you're pretty much set with the shape of the material as you pulled it off. Why I have the tag left is if you want a ribbed fly, you follow in the segments of the dubbing, and you can have a ribbed hair's ear. Again, what's nice about the technique is if you don't like the shape of your fly, you're not stuck with what you did. You can easily unwrap this and I want the front end thicker and I want it shorter, I can push my material up and down the thread, like so, because it's not anchored to it, and create a fatter front end for my fly, and finish off very thick, and in shorter fashion. Like so. I'm not locked in a loop, so I can do what I want. And that's how we do a standard hair's ear with blended dubbing 
and we can follow up with a rib if we like. Okay. <laughs> All right, the next segment is going to be on furling using the roped up technique. If you'll notice some of my sample flies on the card here, we see that the body is extended on there. So what I'll do is show you how to do the extended body using furling technique using the rope dub. I'm going to pull my dubbing out in a long strand, a little bit at a time, so that I have a lengthy section, not very thick. Tie that down to the hook. Now this is going to be the body of my fly, so I'm using a short hook that I can leave the extended body to the back, and then I'm going to wrap my material around and create my rope dub. The reason this becomes possible now that the thread has not been spinning with the dubbing, the dubbing is extremely tight. It wants to curl on itself if I allow it, okay? It will do that. So we're going to control that by coming back here, swapping hands, picking a spot for the length, and start our twist here while we're twisting the dubbing right here. This is a little bit of advanced technique, but you can see how as I twist this forward dubbing, it curls it. Okay, what we're going to do now is change our material altogether and go from a dubbing to a feather. And since the rope dub is good at binding anything in, that's in a linear fashion down to the thread and twisting it around, we can use feathers for this. And notice when you look at a peacock sword, you'll see very fine feathers from over here going into very thick feathers. You'll get great coloration, but the feathers are kind of hit and miss along the shank. But we can use that in our favor in our rope dub technique. We also have some very long feathers here for big bulky flies so we can have a hook this way and basically all to tie this technique all you'd have to do is pull a few feathers out and that's our basic material to do our dubbing. So from there let's start with flies and I'll show you by the, the technique and by some sample flies how peacock is adapted with the rope dubbing technique. Now let's go ahead and rope dub using uh, peacock as our dubbing. As you see right now, I'm tying with my monofilament thread, the heavy six pound test. I've already fastened the hackle down. I've already fastened my core wire down because we're going to make this a bulletproof fly. I like that aspect of it. Also, when I pull my dubbing off of my saddle or my strung dubbing, I have a bunch of uneven tips. Well, I don't want to use the tips anyway because those are pretty weak. The rope dubbing puts a lot of stress on the material at the point of the tie-in. So let's get rid of those weak points before we start. Also, by practice, I'll know how much bulk I want in the fly, so in the length of it, and I'll cut the base ends off so that now I've got a nice, neat little strip to work with. And I'll show the fly first with only the wire and the peacock so that you can see a peacock fly per the samples I've shown and we'll have that portion of the fly done and you'll see as it quickly rope it out wrapping so tight but now as I wrap around the fly you can see that it goes so tight I actually get segmentation but I'm going to back that off because I don't want to use just a peacock. If I were to palmer the hackle just in the other fly, like I did with the other fly, it could get bit and come loose. But I'm going to add, almost when I start my rope, the hackle to it. Now my chenille, which is basically what I'm building, a wire cord chenille, like you see with dubbing brushes. And as I go forward, I pull my hackles backwards. And you can see segmentation in that fly. And then when I finish in the front, I let my hackles go. A couple of twists over it to finish it off, to get it out of the way. And again, this is only the back end of the fly. We would be covering the front end with whatever we're doing to finish the fly. And take the excess off. And now we have 
the back end of this fly, basically from here back is what we're concentrating on, is getting the tail end. And I have a segmented peacock fly, palmered with whitings, and we have the finished fly. <laughs> Now, just for demonstration's sake, let's tie an iridescent bluish-green housefly tail. So I'm going to take my material off the peacock sword that is very bluish-green, and depending upon the density and size of the fly, I'm going to gather it up to where I have the tips all lined up, snip them off, and tie them down. I'm going to use my tying thread as the base spin the material around and then work my way up and I have the iridescent bluish green back end of a housefly that quick and easy. It's very durable because it's got a mono core and if you want it even more durable up the weight of that or go to a wire underneath. If it's dry fly I normally stick with a heavy duty mono core. Wet fly I'll go with wire for weight and durability. And that's the finish back end of that fly. And we'll show you finished patterns later. Okay, now short and sweet, we'll demonstrate how to... So I am going to pick a section of that, or I can break the feather, and save the two sides for another fly, and then use this central part here for the fly. I'm going to allow a little bit of my dubbing material to extend back, and that's going to become the tail of this fly. A couple of tight wraps to secure the material. Bring my material over the top and create my rope dub with the marabou. Spin it down, and as it tightens, it'll tighten up to the shank of the hook. And as I wrap forward, I have a monocord marabou chenille that I finish off at the front end where I would do my wing casing and eyes, legs, whatever I wanted to finish the pattern. But there is a soft, fluffy, translucent looking marabou dubbed fly. As you can see with this marabou fly that I've finished a little while ago, I've done the tail in the marabou and you can see the segmentation that the rope dub creates I've done a wing casing, mono or bead eyes, and I have my finished pattern. The same thing creating a mayfly nymph. I have the tail fibers a little bit longer, a shorter fuzzy body, two bead eyes with the front end of the marabou wrapped through the eyes creating a fuzzy front end. Now I have a mayfly imitation. <laughs> To our flies. Well, we all know from tying how weak this front portion is of an aftershaft, but if we just go ahead and tie that down delicately, then carefully take our aftershaft, spin it in our fingers, again carefully. I know it's hard to see that, but I'm doing the rope dub technique, spinning the butt end around and then holding it in place with my other hand. I can show you a little bit better here how it's spun by holding my thumbs down. See how that tightens up? Well, now I have a little piece of chenille that has the core of it, the monofilament, and now I can wrap that around the fly and hackle the fly with an aftershaft to where it's durable. Okay, what we're going to do now is do a dry fly application of the rope dub. To save time, I've already anchored the hook I've put on the tail fibers and right now I'm using about pound and a half monofilament line. It gives me good durability and it makes a good base for the rope dubbing since we don't want the dubbing to adhere to the thread. We actually want to spin it around which makes it different. From Here I'm going to pull a little bit of my dubbing out of my dry fly dubbing pack and you'll see it pulls out in a nice little teardrop. If I tie the back end down if I want a very fine taper I start with very few fibers pull that outside of the thread alongside and then start my spin. As you'll see it's tight there and that tightness extends until it gets to the front end and the whole deal goes tight. 
So now when I wrap this fly, I get a small t segmented back end. And as I go towards the front, it gets thicker. And I end the fly with little segmentation because that's where I'm going to put my hackle and wings up against that base. So now that fly is finished. Here's two caddis fly applications. One is just a bare tail with a deer wing on it and a tail portion for a parachute style with a emerger drop tail. The other is a fully hackled trude type and this is our peacock you see on the left and then with a finished dry fly pattern on the right. If you can see this, the right fly also has segments on the tail and that's done with the rope dub. This moth fly right here is done in two steps. First the wings were tied down and then I made the rope at the back and made segmentations for the tail and the fluffy front portion I took through the wings to position the wings and tied it off and the fly is tied. Now what we'll look at is a few house flies. Remember we did the iridescent peacock and did the tail segment. If we finished up that house fly, we'd have patterns that look like this. Again, I roped the iridescent green for the front end, used red beaded monofilament eyes, some winger feathers from whiting for the wings, and I used the tips of the rope dub to make the legs. Once I freed the rope dub, that became my legs, and that was the fibers I was wrapping. And there we have the common house fly. Okay, what we're going to do now is work with hairs and furs, which is one of my favorite parts of the rope dubbing technique. And what we have here is a blended set of furs, uh, rabbit hair for tying hare's ears. Then we have different types of furs out here. We have, I think this is Russian sable, this is badger, this is chinchilla, this is arctic fox, this is Australian possum, this is squirrel, and this is synthetic seal hair. Uh, the same technique that we've done with everything else works well for these materials and works excellently if you use the material raw right off the hide. Here we have a blended dubbing again and basically they've taken many of the properties away from uh, the hair on the hide, but in the hair that we can use to our benefit. We've got long hairs, we have intermediate hairs, we have under fur, and we've got down next to it. If we use those to our advantage with the rope dubbing technique, we'll have very many looks at the flies, and we'll be showing you examples. Uh, very many finished flies, uh, flies that look good, basically using the one material. And we can take parts of the material away and use just portions of it. So if I wanted to have a certain look, I could use just the down underneath and give the down certain looks. Since I play so much with the different materials for looks, what I'll do is make a bunch of ties with a hair. This is fox. And you can see I have different materials, different ways to tie that material, different looks. And I'll poke those through the hide so that when I come back and look at the hide, I can see the effects that that gives me and pick the proper hide for the look that I want. Now let's move on to tying with this and you'll see how quickly the rope dub makes furs right off the hide work for you. Okay, as you see here, I've got the hairs in my finger with the butt ends here, the tips there. And I'm going to tie just a few of the tips down. That's going to be my anchor point, which will allow me to place the thread now along the base of the hair and start spinning my hair around the thread, as you see now. As you see, the, th the tips of the hair will continually be on the outside of the rope. And as I tighten the rope, the hackles now are basically the tips of the guard hairs. I complete that. They've locked themselves in because of the nature of the hair. As I get tight, I wrap around, form my segmentation, and comb the hairs back. And I form a fluffy 
segmented tapered fly that has the guard hairs as hackles. Now let's say I wanted to change the look of this fly. I didn't like the way it came out. All I have to do is unwrap it. Remember, we have the thread to act as a pallet. And we can change the look of this material on that by moving it up and down. So if I wanted all the hackles at the front of the fly, at the very tip, I move them up here and would leave a very slender body in the back. I would spin that tight. And that would give me a segmented look on the back, like so. And then as I get to the front, it would leave the hackle portion. And we'd have that look for the fly. And it's very tight. Those hackles will not pull out. All right, now what we're going to do is show a tying technique using a piece of fluffy fur. I believe this is Russian sable. Don't have it marked, but it's got a very long, dense under fur and then very few guard hairs. But these mid hairs are very fine and then a very fluffy bottom hair. So when I take my clip, I can design the look and taper of my fly by spinning it out and looking at the shape. So it's got only a few fibers here and then it starts dense. I can grab those few fibers and pull them to make that midsection longer and now that gives me a finished fly that has a different taper than the stock fly did. So now I have a very thick front end, I have a piece back here that will segment nicely and then I have tail fibers. What I can also do, I've prepared this one, is mix a little bit of flash in the front so that when I do my throw out I'm having to handle the material and every time I push my fingers down I push the material down with it. But if I want to keep the material fluffy and quickly finish my rope I can use a material pliers put it on there like so and spin it. This quickly finishes the rope keeps me from having to put my fingers all over the dubbing and it gives me the look that I want. So now I have my tail fibers, I have a fine back end that I can create my segments, and I have a thick, fluffy front end with sparkle ice dub that I can finish off the fly with. So as I go forward, now I finish the thorax with my sparkle dubbing, and I have the completed fly. Notice many times I finish hide. When you start the fly, you can put lead underneath to weight it. You can put a bead up in front. But wherever you design the fly, your rope dub applies the material to give you your finished look. So now I have a tail, I have a segmented back end, and I have a fluffy front end that I can pick out to the desired amount, all in one. Here we have another good example how the rope dub can vary a certain type of fur to look different ways. I have a piece of Australian possum, very kinky, very dense, very fluffy, but very soft to the touch. And it would move a lot, so this would be more for a stonefly pattern. And then, just to see how it would look, I left the entire fly fluffy just by rope dubbing it, leaving all the tips sticking out. We have a very fluffy fly that I could use for shrimp patterns, crawfish, and the like by shaping the fly. Now let's work with badger hair. If you'll notice, it's got a lot of long guard fibers and then a very dense underbody. So instead of blending this, let's work with it straight off the hide so the qualities of the material as they grow gives us our dubbing capabilities. Notice we've got long guard hairs. We can use those for tail, for segmentation, and then this portion up here, we don't have it quite so dense. We can use it for the underbody of the front end of our fly. So fundamentally, fundamentally we get a taper effect that we can work to our good. So I'm going to use the tail fibers from the guard hairs to make the back end of my fly. 
and then I'm going to bring this around and start roping the front segmentation. And as you get more practice, you'll watch how this forms and create the look that you want as it comes from the, the hook outward. So now I've roped, I've got my material tight, I've ended up with a fluffy body up front. I bring my material over and I start my dub towards the front. And as you see my segmentation, as I get to the front end of the fly, I have my fluffy thorax and I finish the fly off. I have a very buggy looking start for a stonefly. Add eyes, wing casing, legs, clean it up a little bit. And with the raw fur right off the hide, I have a back end of a fly. segment of this video we're going to be doing synthetic seal. One of the things tires find about synthetic seal when they try to dub it it's very unruly kind of does what it wants to do flies apart and it's very very difficult to get shape. As you'll see from these two flies depending upon how you tie with the rope dub the back end on this fly is body and then we have a picked out full body that you would use on a salmon fly or a steelhead pattern. I'll go ahead and show you how to attach seal fur. So it's a synthetic, natural will be the same way. Notice that it's very easy to pull the fibers apart. They don't want to stay together. So we'll just grab a group of them and without handling them too much, find a few fibers that we can tie down. Once it's tied down, we can use the thread as the base to keep all the fibers gathered. Notice as I start to spin, these fibers actually want to stay separated. Very hard to get synthetic seal to stay together and that's why it doesn't work very good even in dubbing loops. But as I use my fingers to regather the material, keep spinning, you'll see that it's gathered to the hook and it works its way out away from the hook in a rope as it slowly tightens and becomes a rope dub. Now I can speed this process up once it gets started by using my material tool like so and then spin it out. As long as I have my anchor as this starts to spin it's not spinning the thread it's only spinning the material and it'll tighten that up pretty quick. You'll see how tight that is. Now I move the material up and down the thread where I want it I have the density of the fly, any taper that I want, and I have it picked out as much or as little as I want. And as I wrap forward, it gets one wrap tighter each time I go around. And you'll see, notice I have a bead head on this fly. And I finish up behind the bead with a whip finish. I can either use a tool or by hand. If I wanted multicolors, I would just stack the colors as I did. Pull out the few loose fibers that they are, but notice as only that much came out, the rest is really tight. And it's not going to come out of there. There I have a dense seal fur dub fly. And by changing the way you apply the, the dubbing to the thread, you can get the different looks as we saw before. Here is the same type of fly finished with a tail segmented back end, a fluffy thorax, and if I come back and finish the fly, I can put my eyes, whatever legs I want, and wing casing, do the flashback if I want, and have the finished fly with a segmented back end and underbody all tied with the rope dub. Now if we carry that to the nth degree, you can see that I have this fly roped for the tail. I have biots for the tail fibers. Then for the segmented or for the front end of the body, I have my biots for legs. I have shiny wing casing, eyes. And the original method for the rope dub was developed in order to get dubbing underneath the wing pieces continually in short strands, adding dubbing to dubbing till I work my way around the wings and legs to create the thorax 
portion of the fly up front. That fly there is quite old and that's method started decades ago. Here we have another more recent stone fly using the ice dub. Here I have an overwrap with a tag end segmentation and then a newer pearlescent material and ice dub for the front end and the graduated colors going from a light back end to orange to brown to show how the colors can be done. Now you've had a chance to see Don Ordez in action. It's really a shame that he didn't live longer as he passed away in December of 2020. He left a lot of friends, left many of us who collected his flies, and one I'm gonna show you right now is his uh, platypus. He knew that I went to Australia a lot and he crafted it just for me to take to my friends in Australia. And I kept the uh, platypus and it's in my uh, visor of my car when I go fishing, I think of Don uh, every time. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, as I said before, we are presenting more people like Don for you to get to know. Thank you very much for watching.